but Glenwood Building Department, regardless of the International Building Code, refused to do anything about it. When I went through a very nasty divorce by those people over there, I was not allowed to have my boy and my girl stay overnight because I didn't have a separate bedroom for each one of us. But yet over occupancy is a huge, huge problem in Glenwood Springs. In the building that I live in, there are two three bedroom units. One has a guy and his girlfriend, husband and wife, I'm not sure, and their little kid, and another couple and their little kid in a two bedroom, two families. Another unit has four adults and at least three kids in a two bedroom. Now the IBC very clearly says square footage for occupancy in the living room. Well, one of, the, one of these people, uh, units, they have a bed, bed set up in the living room and nobody seems to want to do anything. Now I live in a two bedroom myself. The HOA, I pay a tithe to the HOA. These people are costing me and other people that live in a unit more because they use more util utilities. Will you please do something? Where I come from, St. Louis, two per bedroom and they enforce it. I'd love to see an occupancy permit system instituted in Glenwood Springs where every year rental gets inspected. And uh, there's more, but I'll stay under my time. I appreciate your all's time. And uh, if you would like to know more, Jonathan and uh, Tony both know her, how to get a hold of me. And uh, if it takes complaints to do something, I'll be glad to file them. I was talking with Hannah and she's like, oh, equity, equity. Well, as a white guy, why am I not treated equi equitably? Why am I discriminated against when it was my own kids? that couldn't spend the night with me according to the orders of those guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. All right, is there anyone else? Brian's not appearing on the agenda. Have we gotten Mr. Uh, yes. I think can I make said. a motion, Mr. May? Yes. City attorney or Mr. Mayor? Please. I don't know what to call you. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I make a motion to permit Mr. Willman, who is under the weather, to appear virtually this evening? I'll second the motion. It's been moved by Tony, seconded by Shelley. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Welcome, Council Willman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would say, um, particularly when we have somebody participating online, please make sure you turn on your mic and lean into them. I put on my mic. Okay, um, we have now consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Moved by Paula, seconded by Shelley. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion yeah, carries unanimously. Oh. Um, Next item is a support for grant application for Welcome Center at Ethan Grand by Colorado Mountain College. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mary. This is what, this is what I'm speaking to. Okay. Um, I have slides here, so I'm going to the screen changed since I was last up. <laughs> And what's your Mary, could you give your name? Hi. So I'm Mary Boyd. I work at Colorado Mountain College, and I'm going to present here in a second a idea we have for our space at Eighth and Grand. That Boyd name sounds familiar. That's it. Oh, yeah. 
Just Thank you, Jen. Okay. Later, but, but. Do I have to be that close? Or can you all hear me? We can hear. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So thank you for having, um, allowing some time on your agenda tonight to hear this proposal. Uh, there are a few people in the room that have already heard it because for the last week or so, I've been presenting to some other subgroups of the city. Um, I was in front of the tourism fund, uh, tourism board last week and DDA earlier this week, um, also um, presented in front of the chamber last week as well. So trying to get a lot of um, invested groups in the downtown space to hear about this project and hopefully express support. So far, we've had a very positive reception. Um, the short story is that we used to have US Bank in the front corner of our eighth and grand building, and they terminated their lease in August of 2020. And the space has been mostly unused since that time. Obviously, the timing of that, um, there were a few other things going on in our world. Um, but we have spent some time thinking about what we want to use with the space and how it can best support both CMC goals and mission as well as um, our community. And so we have spent time meeting with um, internal groups as well as um, some architects that have helped guide us through this process. And what we landed on is really a joint welcome center with CMC and the chamber. Um, that may sound familiar because uh, the current chamber is located, their visitor center and their offices are located in the belly of our building as, as how I like to describe it, because it really is sort of not seen from the street and it is right in the middle of all of our office space. So it doesn't always occur to someone unless they're looking for it to go in to that space and, and be welcomed. And um, additionally for CMC purposes, learning about CMC, it doesn't occur to people to come in off the street and learn about all of the vast array of services that CMC has in our entire um, footprint. So um, as we have worked on this plan, um, we have had quite a few ideas that have come to the table, but really within this space, there's a couple key components that I'm going to show you. And there's a few renderings. Um, we're still at the conceptual phase, um, but you can see here that the visibility is a much better location being on the corner there. There's windows, front facing windows that you see at the bottom of your screen. There would be a new um, entry that I'll show. And so there's really the visibility of the space. Um, there's also an ability for CMC to have some retail space and speaking with some of the downtown businesses. I think the more retail there is downtown, the more reason there is for people to be downtown and that sort of um, perpetuates more shopping. Um, and then the biggest complaint the chamber has had for years and years within our space is where do I go to the bathroom? So I'm gonna show you, you know, sort of the idea of how the bathrooms fit in as well. So in this conceptual phase, we do have some renderings that I think just help visualize the space and sort of what we um, will hope it would look like. So from the street, um, we would change the windows so that you could see into the space. You'd be able to see that there is both um, some merchandise for sale if interested, and as well as a lot of gathering and learning and things that are going on in the space. Uh, the wall that was a brick wall that had the ATM would have new glass doors so that from either direction, you're really seeing visually into the space. Uh, a large welcome desk that would have both chamber staff and CMC staff present. Currently, there's only chamber staff working at their desk and they field questions for CMC. As I said, there's not a whole lot of CMC traffic currently that's needing a front presence like that. Um, but for our vision of sort of an information center, there would be plenty of information kiosks and information available both about CMC as well as about the city and the area and the county and all of the things that are to offer maybe information kiosks that have information on our programs, but also you could make your reservation for rafting or, or things that are of interest within the city. Um, so you can just see as you sort of walk through the, the perimeter of this space, the retail space is pretty limited in size. We have one store up at our Spring Valley campus that does, we sell a little bit of merchandise. It's not a, it's would not be a revenue maker for us, but it would be something that would be able to get our branding out and help people learn and understand about CMC, promote what we do. There will be um, information spaces where you would have branding as well as, you know, as um, things that you could learn. And an exciting feature is a Zoom room that we have planned that we really envision being a connection hub. And so it would allow someone, either a student or a prospective student or a family member to be able to uh, plug in to any one of our many locations across our 12,000 square foot footprint uh, for services at our campuses, which includes also dual language um, services. And then also from the chamber perspective, um, an ability for clients to meet with businesses and things. And again, with that dual language um, 
theme in that space as well as in our signage throughout the space. So as you continue to walk to the back here, this is where the doorway would be to the bathrooms. And a short walk down this hallway, there would be two public unisex restrooms and a water filling station um, that's really intended for anyone off the street to come use. And so um, obviously that block at 8th and Grand um, doesn't currently have restrooms that are outside of stores that I think get asked a lot for, for restroom space. And so certainly that would be the element of the project that I would imagine my interest um, do all even more than some of the other features. And um, we have, as I said at the beginning, have gone sort of made the rounds to the different groups over the last week or so. And um, thus far, all of the groups have really been supportive of this project and would really um, like to help see us make it a reality. Um, in terms of the FMLD application itself, the deadline is August 31st. Um, we do intend to submit by that deadline. Our board is meeting on August 30th. And so we're, we'll have um, their resolution signed just in time for the application the next day. Um, and we are really hopeful to have a robust um, set of letters of support to include in that application material. And that's the main request of you all this evening to consider would be that letter of support. Um, it is a costly project and one that is a little bit outside of the realm of what we um, necessarily do with money at, with, uh, excuse me, with CMC funds in terms of the priorities. We're really focused right now on finding affordable housing in our areas and some specialized instructional centers like the uh, nursing simulation lab up at Spring Valley and things like that. Um, but working together, we're envisioning that we would be able to present a matching request um, to FMLD and we would work on sort of the elements of that match on our end, um, but request that they go in 50-50 on the project with us. We think it may cost upwards of $1.4 million. And so that's part of what we'll work on through uh, the fall and hopefully um, be able to talk with some of the city processes in terms of the budget process that you all have um, coming up in, in the future. But as of today, really the request would be um, to hear whether it's a project that you all could support and would be interested in writing that in a formal letter that we could include with our application materials. Questions? Thank you, Mary. Mary, would they take into consideration if, if we um, support, number one, yes, support it um, by voice, which I would approve, but the monetary support, would you look at the possibility of adding opportunities for hanging lake reservations? We would absolutely have an opportunity for hanging lake reservations. Okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we want to have this to be sort of a hub where you can connect to all the things that our community needs people, wants our tourists and our students and our community to be able to connect to. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. If this is serving just the downtown, which I love this idea, I think it's fantastic, but what would be the hours for accessibility for the bathrooms? So that question was asked at the chamber meeting. Um, currently the chamber staffs their desk from nine till five Monday through Friday and from 10 till two on Saturday. Um, when they were asked that question, they did express that they would be looking to expand their weekend hours. Okay. Um, our staffing and their staffing and how we pair that together is something we, we would work through within our own collaboration um, and would depend a little bit on do we really, I mean, is the, is the merchandise enough to maintain additional staffing on our end mm -hmm. or have, you know, maybe some hours that are just chamber. We'll work through those details, but I think the interest would be to expand the weekend hours. I think the nine to five fits pretty okay with the flow. Mm -hmm. um, during the weekdays, but certainly there would need to be some expanded weekend hours and that's um, in talks. Okay, that's great. And then I see that for the fiscal impact that down the road, there's 150 to 200 K in needed funding. We have never touched the 7.5 additional funds from tourism that we appropriated, correct? That's Sorry, right. okay, yeah. yeah. And then we, didn't we do that effective the start of this year? Yeah, we did it in the start of 2022. Mm -hmm. So we had a $100,000 reserve that we set aside. Okay. There'll be another couple or 115,000 or so in 2023. Mm -hmm. You would also have room if you wanted to, I think, to use some reserves from the GIV fund. Okay. Um, the general improvement district that's for downtown only really we've got mm -hmm. a little bit of room there. Okay. And then in our next meeting, you'll hear from the DDA and the tourism board. So if this is something you guys support, we might see if they wanted to pitch something in. That's exactly what I was hoping for. If anybody had heard what the, the DDA was willing to contribute, just so that we have a really nice, tidy understanding of our fiscal impact. 
I haven't heard from the DDA specifically. I have heard from the tourism board mm -hmm. and uh, they did express interest about the seven and a half percent that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then in the draft budget that I've seen, they have another $50,000 in their regular operating budget okay. that they would be willing to throw in. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarity. And thank you for presenting this idea. It really seems really well vetted and, and I'm excited. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just, just quick, Mr. Mayor, if I may. I'm just curious, Is uh, would you say the... Uh, City of Glenwood and CMC are represented equally in this space? Um, yes. Like, I, I mean, I, I figured merchandise looked like it was more geared towards CMC, but well, we also it, have some sort of Glenwood generating income. We could look at that. So far, the chamber has not expressed interest in having inventory, okay. but it it is it's a space to sell things. And so if the city was interested in having a part of that, I mean, I think our staffs will be sharing the responsibility of the actual point of sales. And so that would logistically be something we'll work through in, a part, in our partnership with okay. them. So that would be a possibility for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Dr. Hershey? I have a comment. Yep. It's oh. Debbie, you know. So I just wanted to tell everyone, um, the number one question, Mr. Mayor, that anyone who comes into the, a visitor center, and this is true here in Glenwood, and when it was up by Axel Park, is what? What is the number one question? I know. Exactly. <laughs> Where is a bathroom? So to not have bathrooms in that location when people, and it's hard to park right there, but to having people pull over, this would just be so essential. So, I mean, this seems like a no brainer to me. So I'm supportive. Thank you. Okay. Um, is this an action item? Oh, go ahead, Shelly. I, I'll just comment that I also support it very much. So I think it'll be great to liven up that corner a little bit also and make the make the tourism center more public facing. Do you guys have room or have you thought about bicycle parking at all? I think room would be the bigger concern. Um, there's not, I think with the planters there, there's not a ton of space. There is one bicycle rack on eight. Okay. It's in front, like that's near the corner there. Um, I, I don't think the amount of money that we have is all interior space. So there's not, we're not, other than the windows themselves, which we do think need to be replaced, we're not planning on exterior wall movement. So we wouldn't okay. be able to push anything back. I that guess. might be something maybe the city can kind of look at too, because I yeah. can just see uh, maybe that being a draw sure. for more bicycles. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So the U.S. Le bank lease buyout is five hundred thousand. It was four hundred. They they left a three years early, I believe. I I can't remember exactly how early they left, but they had to buy out the remainder of their lease. Who who had to buy it out? U.S. Bank did. I see. So we have put that in reserve so that we have an a designated amount of money that we can use to invest in this space. So we've only touched it so far to remove the bank vault door. It was like a massive door that took. <laughs> I think a month of pounding concrete to get it out. And apparently it's gonna end up in a house somewhere up Valley as a decoration. So, yeah, I had a, I took the picture out, I was trying to keep it short, but I can send you guys a picture. Gotcha. Okay, I just didn't understand. Okay, now I see. So you have that money in reserves from the- We, have, we have parked that money in reserves knowing that we need to spend some money on this space and that that's an easy justifiable thing for our board to be able to say, we got that, we got that money from that space and we can reinvest it in that space. Gotcha. Uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, I think we should probably take a vote. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so the, the request is for a letter of support right now. I would move for a letter of support to the for the Colorado Mountain College for this new visitor center combination store on the corner of Bates and Grant. I'll second that. That's for the grant, right? The letter. We will submit the letter, the letter within the grant application. Right. Definitely. Our letter goes in the grant. Application. Been moved by Tony, seconded by Ingrid. Um, I, I'll support this. I just. I know we're going through a budget process right now, and we have a, a very stickler for a, a acting city manager right now in that process. So as long as that letter doesn't encumber the city right now to a specific dollar amount, because it sounds like we need to talk to some partners on that. Yeah, I understanding the timing doesn't align with a commitment of that sort by August 31st. So I do think in the material, I will say that we will be working with the city to see what kind of pairing we can do. I mean, we're asking them for a match that we don't have fully made. So there will be there's some element of fundraising that we would have to do to make our match. And that will be our conversations with you, but I won't put in writing that there's any firm commitment yet. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Charlie, Charlie. Yeah. 
Trevor Lowman says I. Yes. <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And Good so, luck. Thank you. Just for clarity, um, I would expect to present a budget to you guys at the next meeting on September 1st that has $50,000 to this project in it going from GID and $100,000 from the tourism fund. Does that sound right to everybody? From the 75 Yeah, half it would be that and half just from operations. So you can do whatever you want from there, but that's, unless I hear differently. Well, that's proposed. Yeah. That's proposed, right. right. Okay. Okay. Um, next item is a planning item. We do have a planning item Western Hotel. Western Hotel right away encroachment license, 716 Cooper Avenue. Hey, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Trent High with Community Development here. And uh, in an effort to save you some time tonight, I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a long presentation. Uh, I can just state that staff, uh, your staff has vetted this request this evening and it does meet the applicable criteria outlined in the municipal code. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, the applicant, Candace Whipple, is also here. And um, please, if you have any questions, let me know. Can you just clarify for the public, Trent, can I ask a question? Trent, what the applicant is asking for, I'm sort of familiar with this from what I've heard at HPC and recently, but just clear up just briefly what- Yeah, she, very, what very briefly, um, you know, it is an excellent project and originally the applicant had intended to um, preserve and restore an existing brick wall along that, that alley there, the east-west alley of Block 45 in the original town site. Um, the only issue was once they started looking at that wall and finding that its construction was really inadequate and, and also there were multiple different types of masonry design and bricks used in that and determined that it was not uh, really worth saving or were they able to, to um, add the structural components for their project to that wall? Um, so what they they did instead was uh, propose a new wall that will in the future you know final specs be determined by the historic preservation commission but that wall to be structurally sound includes a foundation with a footer that will encroach up to six feet subgrade into that alley subgrade subgrade underneath the alley yeah. underground <laughs> yeah i understand that but underneath our alley the city's Correct. alley yeah. Correct. Wait. Sorry, may I, Mr. May? Please. Six feet down, <laughs> not over. Well, six inches. Did I oh, say feet? Yeah, I thought you said feet. Yeah. Yeah, feet. yeah. yeah you six said feet. I'm like, wait a minute. Six inches. That's not what six I saw on the drawing. Below, below grade. I actually think it's going to be between six and 10 feet underground, Candace. Yeah. It's, it's significantly underground. And it's only in the alley. The encroachment is only in the alley. Correct. Okay. And it's six inches into the alley. Correct. Yeah, sorry if I said feet. Okay. I was thinking six feet, six inches, whatever. <laughs> Did the applicant? I have a question. Well, the total width of the foundation, the encroachment itself, is up to six inches. So when I read through that, Trent, it um, said that at any time that they didn't carry the um, insurance for this, that that encroachment could be removed so basically that agreement is we remove the hotel <laughs> no or we would the condos the or whatever it is and then the hotel would just fall into the alley <laughs> we like... wouldn't remove the extra hotel we would just remove so i'm just I, i'm sorry I'm no sorry. i'm just like i was so, just like well that's, it, that's it, would, it would be in the best interest of the city and the applicant one to maintain uh, that insurance um and indemnification um, into the future. Um, I, I'm sure that if there were ever an issue that we did not have that, we would probably reach out to them before we remove their foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilor Wilman. Councilor Wilman. Yeah, Trent, um, as I understand this, this would not interfere with the <clears throat> DDA's plan to improve the alley and the service and the drainage in that alley. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thanks. That was actually, Charlie was one of my questions and just what is the long range plan for the DDA? But in addition, is it at all possible to do a different construction methodology that would avoid this encroachment? No, we've tried, we've done allocation. Can, can yeah, you, yeah. you want to come on yeah. up and, and say your name and your address? Thank okay. you. Um, I'm Candace Whipple. The address is 764, but I'm the developer on the project. But we spoke with our structural engineer when this problem 
arose and they tried two different scenarios, an L shape as well mm -hmm. as a smaller T shape. And the where the wall is in line, it would fall over essentially without what we've come mm -hmm. to propose tonight. So unfortunately, no. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Tony, you have your light on. Do you have a question? I actually have one more question. Go for it. Sorry. From a legal perspective, we have a license. I've sold houses in downtown that have a license to encroach. You can stay up if you want to. Um, that have license. Do you see any concerns? No, I mean, we actually do these all over mm -hmm. in the core downtown. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we even have some provisions for, you know, depending on how big they are, we approve them administratively. Okay. Um, it's a zero lot line environment. And so oftentimes, especially on subgrade mm -hmm. footers, we have to do these. Okay, thank you. Carl, is this a use by right? The building? No, the encroachment. No, okay. otherwise it wouldn't be a license. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I ask? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For me, Tony, or somebody else. No, I have a question. Go ahead. For Ms. Whipple. Can you just briefly, because my neighbors have been asking me and HPC I know looked at this project for a long time. Can you just briefly explain what happened to that wall on the north side and why this is necessary? Um, yeah, so going off of what Trent said earlier, we our idea originally was to keep as much of the existing wall as possible. And um, we came to the conclusion when we were doing demolition that there was no structural integrity of that wall to withstand our project. and. Also, given the current condition of the wall, there was graffiti and there's different materials used within that wall that we decided to take that down. And when we took it down, we realized that we had to change the foundation of it. And that's why we're presenting um, the license. Thank you. And Ms. Whipple, what, what is the use that that building is going to be? Um, we um, are going to build 11 apartments. Um, they're going to be studio and one bedrooms hopefully satisfy some of the housing issues that are currently happening in, Glen in Glenwood. Are they all free market or any would be affordable? Um, they're all free market. Okay. Hopefully affordable it, still. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. There I always are. It's, is that on the first floor too? Yes. I mean, all the first floor? Yes. Um, first floor, second floor, and we're going to build a third floor. And would you consider for the consideration of this license, designating one unit as actual affordable <laughs> um, or retail space on the ground floor? Definitely not retail, just because we can't, as far as just a financial, I don't think we can um, make it work out with, with a commercial space, but um, for like a, uh, I, I guess I just have to see what that would entail. I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess my ask would be is if council is inclined to go that direction, maybe give us a couple of weeks to loop back and negotiate with the applicant. Yeah. Um, Can I ask a question, yeah. Carl? So, but, or maybe Trent, without this, if we just said no, too bad, they can't fix this wall, right? They can't, and, and I think an important, can, they cannot. They, they cannot, okay. not not as the project is currently approved. And I think it's important to also remember that that they still are preserving a very important piece of this wall, the first five feet that are currently located on the lot line. To maintain consistency along that lot line in that building wall, they will do this approach, including the facade, of course. What's that? Including the. The eastern facing or the western facing facade of the western hotel is also correct, being preserved correct, of course correct yeah. street front facade is a portion of that right thank you trent i was going to just mention that i i appreciate the idea of having a designated affordable housing unit within your property and i think that in hindsight i wish we had had that discussion and a more robust discussion to see if we could have guaranteed that at the time but i also know that you have a construction time frame and schedule that you're probably trying to meet so I'm a little hesitant to bring that up tonight and make this conditional. I'd like to get your approval if there's support for that on this license to encroach and then just encourage you to have a dialogue with our staff. That's that's where I would probably be going with this. And, and Mr. Mayor did say consider. So mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure that Candace um, and, and, her, and her father would love to consider that. But yes, they are very tight timeline mm -hmm. in terms of like 
maybe even coring tomorrow. Right. The difficulty with surveyors mm -hmm. and, and masons at this time to carry the court. Okay. Well, so well, with that in mind, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I when I said consider, I. I didn't mean consider. I, I meant <laughs> when you said consider, you didn't yeah, mean. let me be clear. I, I would like to make it a condition of the license. Um, you know, there's 11 units. Trent, what if this came before us? You know, if this had come before us right now with our 10% inclusionary, how many units would they have to dedicate? One. One. Okay. So that's that's where I'm at. But mm -hmm. go ahead if you have a motion. I was going to make a motion to let me just make sure I'm doing it. And, and I, I just do want to be clear: you do need to open this up for public comment. Oh, okay. oh great! Thank you. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you, Trent. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. Sir, sir. If you want to comment, you need to come up and give your name and do the whole thing. <laughs> it's not Wrigley Field, man. You can't throw it from the cheap seats. There are no cheap seats at Wrigley. My name is Jim Shannon, and I got the letter in the mail, and uh, I, I think that the project is going to clean up the area back there. I know in my place, I've cleaned up the area quite a bit in the back, so I was just curious what the project was going to be. I sit back down there. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. It, is there anybody else from the public who would like to comment? Ms. Whipple, did you have something else? I just wanted to answer it. Oh. Well, he, did you understand now what the project's going to be? No, I don't know what it's going to be. Mm. Um, there are going to be 11 rental units, duty on one bedrooms on the smaller side to hopefully help with the housing prices that we have in Bummer Street. So, yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> and are they condominiumized or rentals? Rentals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, making them pretty much as small as possible in order to make them more affordable. And, and if I may, I, I do just want to remind council that one of the exceptions to the inclusionary housing requirements was specific to historic properties to try to encourage their rehabilitation. So, um, you know, because a lot of times it's difficult to remodel these. Um, and also- Clearly. <laughs> okay. okay, so with that in mind, um, I'm going to forego and just encourage a dialogue with your dad about designating one of these affordable, look into the tax benefits of it. Just, we would love it if you wanted to explore that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to make a motion to approve planning item 2222 right of way encroachment license at 716 Cooper Avenue within Western Hotel um, and give that right of way encroachment license to you. Second. Been moved by Ingrid, seconded by Tony. Further comments? Just real quick, I think it's a great project. I uh, prefer the retail over the affordable housing, like we stated before, but more than anything, please give my regards to your parents. All right, Ryan, let's call the question. Do we do it orally because Charlie's on the thing? Yes, we will need to do it orally. 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 That's hard to say. Maybe for you. Mayor Pro Tem Wellman. Yes. Councillor Wusso. Yes. Yes. Councillor Kaup. Yes. Mayor Godis. No. Councillor Dem. Yes. Councillor Step. Yes. Councillor Hershey. Yes. It passes six one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wade, for coming down. All right, item number ten: raise campaign issue spending. Who's going to present on this? I'm curious. Um, Bye. Thank you. You have a draft ordinance that has a blank in it. Please tell me the number you would like to fill in. <laughs> 400. <laughs> Do I get an award for the shortest staff yeah, that's that's ever? Yeah. That, that was good, but can, can you explain? We put this, we increased the limit. Sorry, I jumped in with my question. Is yeah, knock yourself out. Okay, thank you. So we increase the slipper, like both sides, right? I mean, yeah, whether no, they spend 400 or they spend 10,000. Right, no, this is, um, the request that was made by council was to bring back an ordinance that would modify issue committee, um, single entity contributions or single person and underneath the ordinance, everybody's defined as a person consistent with Citizens United, perhaps the worst decision ever by the Supreme Court, except <laughs> for one. 
Um, <laughs> maybe two. not. Maybe not. Plus, C.V. Ferguson. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of them. If you're really into, if you're nerdy about this stuff. Having said that, um, we had adopted these regulations. Um, council was sort of responding to the um, significant spending that went on um, in an issue campaign last fall, about a year ago. Um, at the request, I think it might have been the I, I can't remember which I might have been the mayor, might have been I, I can't remember who. No, it wasn't the mayor. Somebody asked me. Charlie. We had a couple of you, Charlie, ask us to come back with an ordinance that would amend for issue committees. I have no, I mean, it, it's up to you guys, literally what you set that number at. It can be anywhere from, you know, zero to unlimited if you want. Um, so that's it. What do people think? Can I make a comment? Sure. Okay. Well, I feel like Captain Renault in Casablanca played by Claude Rains. I'm just shocked that we're about to have an election in November and we changed the rules. <laughs> And I remember, I think, Mr. Mayor, was it you who supported that? Bringing it down to 400? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Bring it down. Right. And now we're going to raise it up again just in time. How fortunate. So landed interests can raise tons of money to support a new tax to make more building. I don't, I, I, I don't support the change here. Thank you. Actually, this is an ordinance. So oh, if, I, if I didn't ask a question. Yeah, I would say, yeah. Well, too late. You know where my if we have <laughs> okay. so we have questions then we'll turn it, it over. Question, oh, oh. There you go. I do have a question, and that is in in your other municipalities that you represent. Do are there any limits that you could share with us as as perspective? Uh, most of them are around these same numbers. Some are a little bit lower. Um, some are up to five hundred or a thousand. Okay, but that applies to both candidates mm -hmm. and committees. Okay. Um, but I think in the last wave of elections, we saw those numbers tighten up a lot. Well, your mic is on. Do you have a question? Oh, no. Sorry. That's okay. Charlie, any questions? Nope. Okay. We'll open up for public comment. Anybody from the public like to comment on this item? Last time I cut it off, you jumped up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Anybody online? <laughs> All right, see, now we'll close public comment and bring it back for additional comments. So I'll just reiterate that I'm not supportive of this. Thank okay. you. Shelly? I'll just chime in also that I, I don't support changing it. I'm comfortable with the number where we are, and I'm not comfortable with the optics of changing it right before an election, as pointed out here. But I'm also just not comfortable with the concept of uh, having large amounts of money go into any of the city elections that we have. So I prefer to keep the limits pretty moderate or modest. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, that the reality is, especially if we wanna use this upcoming election item, is that the average person who is paying an overly glorified amount of rental at, every single month, say, $2,000 or whatever for a small two bedroom apartment um, may not have the discretionary income to support something that would actually benefit them. Um, and so with that in mind, I think it falls on those who may be more financially stable on either side of an election item um, to, to maybe help and support the issues that we have within a community. I am not comfortable increasing <laughs> candidate spending I think individually, you know, you're on your own. You may have to ask for a lot of people to give you some money. Um, but when it comes to these larger issues that do deeply impact our community, growth, no growth, um, development, or, you know, a tax of some kind, I think that the campaigns do cost a little bit more money. Um, and the, the ability to donate to them or to support them, I should say, not donate, but to sponsor them. Um, I think that it's important to, to have a more more funds available. So I would like to propose that on this one, we actually increase it to something around, you know, $2,000, $2,500. That's my comfort level. It's it's not significant, but it allows uh, adding the paper or, you know, something that has some substance to get the message out to our voters to educate them. Because I think educating our, 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 our community on these items is what we most inherently want to do. And when they don't have the money to support a campaign and to educate people, 
I think that a lot of times electors go in not knowing the issues completely, unless, you know. Charlie. I, I agree to a large extent with what Ingrid said. The, the issues that we have as a council is we see the need to raise funding for the city for various things from time to time, streets, uh, water systems, uh, things like that. It's, it's a difficult thing because under Tabor, we can't go out and advocate for it as a, as a government or as government officials. And this allows people who support um, effective government and, and effective spending of government to help us raise the funds and help committees raise the funds to support these projects because um, it's real easy to say no if you don't understand it. This helps people understand the types of things we're looking for. And I would agree with Dingrid, I would support something in the two to two to 500 range. So if anyone wants to make that motion, I would second it. Other comments? I, I have a comment. I think, you know, Ingrid, you brought up a, a point of, you know, people are struggling to make rent. And so that $400, you know, to some people it might as well be 4,000. Um, but, you know, I think a, a lot of people that live in this community probably, probably can come together for fifty hundred dollars I see um, GoFundMe campaigns all the time for uh, oh that poor gentleman who got hit on his bicycle has a GoFundMe campaign and there's it's amazing to see the outpour from the community of people who have no idea who this guy is and so that's that's a neat thing to see but you know back to the citizens United you know money should not equal power or voice and to say that an issue campaign can go both ways and so to say that somebody who and we're talking about pro-growth versus no growth specifically, the pro-growth usually has the deep pockets that can throw 10, 20, $30,000 by getting together at $30,000 at say 2,500, you need to get to like, like 12 people. Um, 12 people wanna see growth of some kind would have such an outsized voice because they'd be able to hire door knockers and put ads in the paper and do a, a robust social media campaign. Whereas, you know, maybe it's not popular with the populace who can't afford it. So when money does equal voice and power, um, you know, this, this is exactly the reason I think a year ago, less than a year ago, we actually brought the limits down. So there is more of an equal playing field. So I, I, I think, you know, if you're going to raise it up to 2,500 um, and that's the will of this council, I, I would suggest that it be um, raised up for candidates as well as issues. I don't see really what the difference is. And just understand that this is a two-edged sword. So there might be an issue we do not like <laughs> that's not good for the community, but has some big money behind it. Um, and, and so for that reason, I, I'm not in the timing of this. I, I don't necessarily think that we shouldn't have a conversation about it and kind of run through the paces. But with the election 89 days away, um, I don't know that it's, it's great optics right now. So for that reason, I don't think I will support um, changing it. I mean, if somebody wanted to change it to 500, fine, but I don't know what the point is because we had a pretty labored conversation about this a year ago and we settled on 400. So I guess I would say, I would, I would encourage people that if we're going to change it, let's make it significant enough. So we're not quibbling about 400 versus 650 or something silly like that. Other comments? Ryan, let's call the question. Wait, did you do the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you did a motion. <laughs> no, I didn't nope. say that. Oh, you is a hypothetical. Yeah. Okay. Charlie. Charlie, do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Sure, I'll make a motion that we increase the spending limit for issues, not candidates, to uh, two thousand dollars. I'll second it. <laughs> Sorry. Second Moved by it. Charlie, seconded by uh, Ingrid. Any other further conversation? Ryan, let's call the question. Councillor Musa. Yes. Councillor Stepp. No. Councillor Hershey. No. Councillor Dem. No. Councillor. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Wellman. Yes. 
Mayor Godis. No. Councilor Kaup. No. It motion fails two five or five two. So do we need a motion to maintain it or are we? No. Okay. Stays. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, next item is uh, item number 11, ordinance 2022, amending title 070 regarding standards for extended stay hotels. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. I remember this one. Are you surprised? Yeah. <laughs> who who the puts together these agendas? <laughs> Didn't you put the agenda together? <laughs> so like, long ago. It's like you wrapped the presents and then you know, Christopher's like, oh my God, look at that. I do that. Do you do that? I do that. Yeah. Okay. We'll just refer to him as the goose since I'm the attorney. Oh, yeah, the attorney. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Jen Newton, representing community development. I'm here this evening to pre present Ordinance 2022 20, um, which is amending definitions related to extended stay hotels. So, you recently considered changes to Title 70 related to this. Um, asked for some additional information. Hold on just a second. Let me move that out of the way. Um, asked for some additional information that we can put, additional requirements that we can put into the code related to kitchenettes, and then also um, a requirement for a parking management plan. So the first item it relates to that um, is adding some information about kitchenettes related to storage, refrigerator, um, and food preparation area. I spent a lot of time um, at that meeting where you considered this, uh, trying to find a minimum standard for kitchenettes. Um, I only found one from Houston, um, but it seems like they're not for kitchenettes. It's really a minimum standard for kitchens. Uh, so some of this language is from that. Um, and I also reached out to uh, Betsy Crumb at the town of Snowmass Village because they have a, a hotel conversion project and got some advice from her. So uh, what we're proposing here is to add um, the requirement or a, a, a possibility of a convection oven rather than requiring the cooktop stove unit with a hood. So we're not thinking it's like a hood that vents necessarily more like a recirculating fan, mm -hmm. but uh, she thought that it still might be difficult to be able to do that in a hotel space. And so she suggested that we include the convection oven. Um, we didn't I didn't um, include a requirement for a specific size of storage cabinets because um, she also thought that it was difficult to be able to do that depending on what those layouts are like. And um, what I've heard from developers is that these kind of older motor court hotels, motels have varying sizes. It's not like the hotels that are built today where kind of everything is uniform. These um, buildings were built over time and they don't have all the same kind of standard space. So it makes it more difficult to kind of fit some things in. A uh, refrigerator with a minimum of 10 cubic feet uh, capacity and a food preparation area of not less than four square feet. That piece, the four square feet, was from that code from Houston. Um, and the rest is the same that's in the ordinance. So the underlined piece is what we're proposing to add. And then we're also proposing to add um, the requirement for a parking management plan to be submitted that addresses parking permits, number of vehicles allowed for lease, and the mitigation plans for impacts to the surrounding properties, but doesn't dictate exactly what that looks like um, and that it would be um, approved by the community development director. And that also should have been underlined. So I apologize that that's, um, it is in the in the ordinance. Jen, you said code from Houston, I heard that right. Yeah, so I, it was the only place, I mean, I looked for a couple of hours. <laughs> it was the only place that I could, and Richard and I spent some time looking at codes and we could not find something that was very specific. What we found was adequate or enough or, um, it didn't have a, you know, any specificity related to what's in the kitchenette. So uh, this is kind of, that's, um, the, it's a new standard. So maybe people will look to us for that. Um, I provided uh, some information here, some pictures. So did talk to an architect uh, who is interested in one of these projects. And um, the idea is that we might have like a modular unit that would go into a hotel space, which I didn't realize that they had these, but um, both of the ones on the left side of your screen, the 75 all in one kitchenette with a dishwasher, they're not necessarily proposing a dishwasher. This is just one of the opportunities for kind of like a built-in um, unit that could go into a hotel room. That is a larger than 10 uh, cubic foot uh, refrigerator. I didn't see one that 
in this model or this um, company that was 10 cubic feet. This is 12 and change. Um, and then the smaller one is the, the more kind of dorm style fridge. I do think that um, developers are interested in that smaller um, fridge because it gives them opportunities. The, uh, the other piece is from um, a newspaper article related to what they did in Snowmass Village. And uh, uh, Betsy Crimson, you know, we're, you know, I'm a developer, we're a developer. Um, she works for the town of Snowmass Village. She's their um, housing director. Uh, she said what we opted to do was have the tall cabinet because there isn't a, a closet in those units um, and to have the smaller refrigerator as kind of the trade-off. Um, and I know that there are developers who are interested in that. We did stick with the 10 cubic feet, which is kind of the small, normal size refrigerator um, that was mentioned last time. <clears throat> Code changes to Title 70. Uh, you consider whether and to what extent it meets these. I won't read them all out loud, but essentially it's um, being consistent with a comprehensive plan and other city policies, doesn't conflict with other, other provisions of the code um, necessary to address a demonstrated need. And um, with that, I'm open to any questions you may have. This is a public hearing, so you will need to give public comment. Yes. Questions? Just a little clarity, Jen. Um, it says uh, built-in cooktop or stove unit with a hood. Got to get this right. Or a convection oven. Do all of these allow for some sort of cooktop? So it would be an or. Um, so in this example, um, for the the Snowmass Village, you can see that they do have kind of a burner situation. And then they also have that convection oven, which is the thing that kind of looks like a microwave. Okay. Um, and then in these other examples, oh, I can't get it smaller. Uh, so th those, the kind of the, the dark area on that countertop is is a stove top or, you know, like a, a burner. Okay. But in that iteration, it doesn't have a stove. There are options that have stoves in these kind of modular that are built in. I'm just thinking most of my cooking is done on the top of the stove, not in the oven. So um, the or part kind of throws me. Right. So I think it's, it's if you would like to have it say um, that it, I think the way that it reads without these changes is that kitchenette shall include cooking appliances, a built-in cooktop or stove unit with a hood. So that's what's in the code today. Uh -huh. Um, and we could certainly say something related to it needing to have a, 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 a stove, you know, what we were trying to do Just, was, or I, I think all, all that's being asked is to confirm that there will be either a stove or a cooktop. You have to have one or the other of those to have some kind of service cooking. No, I think the way that this yeah. is, it, this would allow for the convection oven to be the only cook okay. item. So. Um, and I think that the idea here is that we were trying to make it be safer um, <laughs> because it, you know, today, if somebody is in an, in one of these hotel rooms and they're living there for, for longer than 29 days, um, assuming that that potentially happens um, out there today, that they might be using, uh, you know, like a plug-in one that you get at Walmart that's just like a little coil. Um, well, that's what would concern me fire hazard wise. So, which is where I'd rather have it built into the unit than um, people bringing in different unit, different things off of Walmart shelves or whatever else. So, and and as this is written, it, it the convection oven could be the only uh, right. cooking device. Can we change that? Will my pizza fit on top of? And, and we don't have to have the convection oven in there. We can leave the cooktop or, or stove unit with a hood as the only option. We can take that out. Okay. Questions? Further questions? Yeah. Paula. That was my question. Okay. Um, Charlie. Oh, okay. he was probably before me. Go um, ahead. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Charlie will be next. Uh, hey, Jen. Um, but we could we could do one or the other or the other. That's what it says now, right? It says... Built-in cooktop, built-in stove, or built-in oven at your disposal. Whatever you want to do, that's what and that we that's perfectly fine. If that's what you found in Houston, or snow so mass. That this is this is our this is us. Okay, and the only that I did find the only place I found any standards that I felt could be relevant to this conversation was uh, something from Houston. And what they say? Um, well, there's I didn't write it down. I have to go back to my other computer. I did write down the minimum sink depth and okay. the counter in the storage area, but I didn't write down what they have related to cooking. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. 
Other questions? Yes. Oh, yes, Charlie. Yeah, I'm sorry. A um, couple of things. I, I, I like Marco's wording. I think we need to tighten that wording up a little bit so it does allow for a cooktop of some kind, because it sounds like if you get a convection oven, you don't need a cooktop the way I read it. And maybe it, I'm just being over technical. The second thing is I noticed in the uh, lower left-hand corner of the, the diagram you showed us, they talked about ADA height. I think we should add ADA height. I think we have a commitment to our community to make sure that there's anybody in there that needs an ADA uh, compliant height on uh, the cabinet that ought to be added. And my last, that's, I'm sorry, those are just comments. So the question I have is, it, what's the standard for parking? I, mean, I, I read this and it sounds like there is no real standard for it. It seems to me that we need something. Am I wrong? So the changes that we made last time would allow for the existing parking to satisfy the parking requirement in some cases. It's not in all cases. So for example, if the hotel that was being converted was farther than 750 feet away from an active transit stop, they would have to park it per our standards. So in some cases, it would allow for there to be a um, the existing parking to meet the, the space if they don't increase the number of units. And I think Councilor Cop was really um, concerned that we, if we're doing that, that we require a management plan. And so that's the addition of this language here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Jen. And I, I share the concerns of Councillor Staff and Woolman on the cooktop. I'm just trying to maybe come up with wording that still requires some type of cooking service. Um, and I don't know if, it, if it's an and or, it really doesn't tighten it up enough. I, 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 I think if you just delete convection of them, then you're done. I mean, they could always install one if they wanted to add to that, but it would mean you would either need a soap or a cooktop. And those are as a minimum. Okay. So, yeah. yeah and that really probably down. solves it. Sure. And then on the parking <laughs> issue, I like the way that's written for the management and everything. If you guys think you can handle that with staff, my question kind of coincides with Councillor Willman, though, is do we need a statement around what a minimum is? Like, do do we need to specify that the parking for the units has to be accommodated on site? Or are we going to just, um, I, I understand the state mitigation plans for impacts to surrounding properties, but do we actually want to state that the, pl the management plan should be such that its goal is to keep the parking on site? We could certainly add that. I, I would say that what's there would allow us the discretion to um, I mean, I think we do that today where we have reductions. We have asked sometimes when we have a, a very extreme reduction for that, for the developer to provide us some information about what, if it's a one bedroom that they only have one car with that lease. Right. So, I mean, I think we are doing that today. And I, so I think that this language would allow us to, to um, sort of work with the developer to make sure that what they're doing is appropriate. But it might not require that the parking stays on site. That's true. Correct. Okay. So that's a question, I guess, for council. I think I would prefer that it, the code is pretty clear on that, that the, the goal of the management plan is that the parking is accommodated on site. Any other questions? All right, it's public hearing. I'll turn it out to the public for public comment. All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment and bring it back for further comment or motion. I have a comment. And that is that I, I think we need to tread carefully and lightly in implementing decisions that are based on style of use within this kitchenette. And rather we should remember that as a governmental agency or a government group, we should make our decisions and, and from a legislative perspective, like safety is one thing, but when we're trying to make decisions that that could potentially incur additional costs in our own personal perspective on what we think a kitchenette should be based on our own usage, I think that we um, we become a little overly encumbered, and I think that we need to be cautious there. 
Um, so I'm comfortable with the idea of saying a kitchenette has some basic standards that keep people safe. But I think this is goes a little bit beyond that and my comfort level with that because I think it could it it just backfires. It makes it so that maybe even developers think, gosh, the cost to do that is exorbitant or they always do it one way and we just are putting so many parameters. And when our parameters are beyond just health and safety and into personal preference, I'm just not comfortable there. Mr. May, if I may. Uh, Ingrid, uh, just real quick, what would you remove? I, I think that I would change it to just say something along the lines of a cooktop or, or stove unit. And I'll take out so much of the other stuff that we put in. <laughs> okay. And I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> wordsmith it. I just think that anything that, that is based on our personal preference for how we cook. And instead we need to just say, is there a safe cooking device? Are there two sinks? So you can use one in the bathroom and one in the kitchen, and then just let the developer or the building owner do it themselves. Okay. Here's, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Here's what, here's what I would, Here's what I'm thinking, looking at this, and I, and I agree along along your lines there, um, that I think we're looking, getting a little bit too far into the weeds here. But I think we should um, remove the convection oven. I think we should remove the 10 cubic foot capacity, just say a refrigerator. And I think we should take the four square feet out and just say a preparation area. And if you please bring up the uh, photo for the snow mass um, um, conversion, the that's the right photo i assume um i think that's a perfect conversion the fridge is smaller no problem you got a lot of storage you got a tiny cook plate you got two large larger sinks and the food prep is the sink so to me that's almost perfect i also want to point out that there's no hood is that the one on the right yes this cooktop functions without a hood i don't know what they did they don't have any extraction so one under I, oh, it's I, so hi, I highly, I know any stuff, I highly. I actually don't think that there is because it's a convection oven. And so the stove top is kind of the glass stove top. I don't think that this is. That there is a, because you don't need to extract the CO2. So you just, it's just for steam and, and all that. So I think that's, that's, I think all we should shoot for and yeah. limit, limit the, the regulations a little bit. That's my comment. Shelly? Um, I will just say that I, I, don't agree with that. I actually like the wording that the that staff came up with. I think it's okay to have some minimums because if we look at rents in this town, realistically, these places are going to be going for what nine hundred dollars a month. I think there should be some minimums. If you need more, oh, oh yeah. gosh, $1, more. $1, okay, no. oh, yeah. for something like that. So I think it's okay with. To have some minimum living standards and minimum standards for things like food storage and honestly a two by two foot prep area to prepare your food and be able to maybe wash it at the same time if it's working on top of the sink I have a hard time even imagining trying to live that way so i i would say we leave it as staff proposed uh if it's if if you're more comfortable taking out the convection oven and just leaving that to the discretion of the developer, but I wouldn't take out the other things. And then the parking, I'm gonna defer to staff to that. If you think this is manageable, or I'd love to hear from other council members, but I'm not I'm not gonna be, you know, overly strict on that. So I like the job you did on this, Jen, and the rest of staff. And so I'd like to see it stay pretty close to what we have now. Charlie. Yeah, I tend to agree with uh, Shelly on the comment on that, leaving the standards in. I mean, if you look at those pictures, um, it's not just, it doesn't take it very much space. Um, if someone's going to come in and develop the property, I think we have a duty to make sure that the people who are going to occupy that property have a reasonable kitchen so they can cook because they obviously can't afford to eat out if they're in, in a unit like this or they shouldn't be. Uh, then we should be providing that. So I, I agree with Shelly on that. My only concern in the parking, as I mentioned before, is I think we need some standard. I'm worried that and maybe I'm just, you know, I thought back about Jen said, and I forgot that was in there, that they don't have to really make changes to it, but maybe make, make sure at least they have one parking space per unit. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's just, we don't need that, Jen. I don't know, maybe you've never thought of that, but 
I think that my um, my understanding is that some of these may have one per unit, um, but I don't I don't have a, a an understanding of every uh, all of these hotels. I, ha I haven't actually counted the parking as it relates to the units. We do think that in this one case that where I talked to the architect that the number of units that they have will have to decrease. They will have to, um, I think it's five that they have to combine because of the minimum um, standards related to how much uh, square footage needs to be at the living area. So those are intended to be um, converted to ADA units. Uh, Go ahead, Shelly. I'd like to make a motion. Sure. I would move that we adopt ordinance number 20 of 2022 with the change that we strike from the uh, extended stay hotel, the kitchen standards that we just strike the part of the sentence that says, or a convection oven and um, leaving everything else as proposed here. I'll second that. Been moved by Shelley, seconded by Paula. Further comments on the motion? Marco. If I may, um, I, of course, I'm gonna support this because I wanna see this happen. Um, but I wholeheartedly believe that a 10, fridge, a 10 cubic foot refrigerator is not necessary for this. And a smaller unit would be perfectly fine. Um, it's a matter of $1,200 to $400, which could make or break a deal. But like I said, I will support this because I want these conversions to move forward. Um, I'll also support this. You know, I, I see that picture up there and I think that kind of looks nice with the smaller fridge, but I also think it's really important that people be able to have a fridge big enough to have some fruits and vegetables and be able to not be reliant on takeout boxes and such a small, you know, especially since we're, we're relatively in a food desert and we're talking about a lot of these hotel conversions being potentially in West Glenwood, um, you know, people need to be able to not have to go to the grocery store every single day to eat unprepared food. So I'll also support this. Um, any other comments? Why are you picking on me about those food boxes? I don't even know where the kitchen is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ryan, let's call the question. I'm just kidding. Um, Councilor Step. Yes. Councilor Lee. Yes. Councilor Dem. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wellman. Yes. Mayor Gotis. Yes. Councilor Hershey. No. Councilor Kaup. Yes. Councilor Wusa. No. It passes by two. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jen. All right, next item, subsurface. Oh, I'm sorry, citizen ordinance 2022-21, a citizen comment. Mm -hmm. I've never been mentioned in the staff memo before. The hell? Are have you, you sure? Read it? Not the ones that are public. <laughs> not the good ones. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm going to already used up more than I did the last time. Uh, I deleted a few words. Are there any questions? What do you mean deleted a few words? Uh, requiring an address. Um, in today's world, I was trying to make a shorter staff report. In today's world of uh, um, a concern about personal security and also um, identity theft. You know, we actually going back to the mid 2000s, we started really looking at this issue and being concerned about it at the dais in various communities because once your address is out there, that is a data point that can be used um, not only for personal safety reasons, but also for, you know, there again, on cleaning any kind of personal information off the internet. Um, I think in most of the jurisdictions I now work in, uh, unless somebody volunteers it, the only thing that is being asked for is whether or not you are a resident of that community. And I think that typically is enough, um, but it's council's decision. And I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Hershey, I only pointed it out because you were right about the about the code. And so I thought it was important no, to give you perfect. credit. And I have a comment when we're ready, but I know we have to take public comment too. Questions first. Any questions? Oh yeah, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. And thank you, Ingrid. You're muted. I think if I waved, I get your attention. So, you did. Um, uh, Carl, is there a reason we aren't changing this to three minutes, which is consistent with not only our practice, but the uh, procedural code we passed a year or so ago? Um, 
to me, we had a we had a bit make it consistent with whether other other things we've talked about. Yeah, it's up to council if they want to do that. I was not going to be the one to shorten public comment in my staff report. <laughs> okay, good question. Uh, I also have a question in that vein. Uh, our, our current code says six o'clock that our meetings start. Other than blah 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 and some a lot of words, can we just say six or later? We or certainly could. On or about? On or about? Um, six or later, I think is fine. Because um, there, there's some like weird legalese about other than if decided by a vote of the majority of yada yada that we haven't. We've thinking. always taken the position that as long as it starts later than six, nobody is prejudiced by that start time. Okay. And then the only other thing I'd have if, if we're cleaning up is it, it does say that we will abide you by Robert's rules of orders. And I think we strive to, but other than <laughs> at least what Charlie claims to, <laughs> we, we, we probably don't do a really good job. And I, I don't know if that needs to be in there or. I, I think the problem is, is that it, um, I mean, we could say generally follows Robert's rules um, and I can do a little tweaking on second reading on this. Um, the, without that, like literally you have no framework. Okay. And I don't, I don't have one to say, well, the, that's a substitute main motion. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, and Charlie, there was a number of things that Charlie that we adopted internally that weren't codified. Um, and I think those just simply modify how we use Robert's rules, but I still think we need a touch point. And, and I agree. I just, I yeah. I just don't want to be held hostage by the fact yeah. our code says we will. And when six of us, really don't have a great understanding of it uh so that would be a motion to suspend the rules <laughs> or which i don't know or an opportunity to educate yourself if it's in our code we all took an oath to, to abide by the code and the charter then we take the time to learn it and if it means that we need to have a work session on it we do Um, I was just going to refer back to Charlie's comment earlier about um, that we use three minutes, and I think we've already covered that by us yeah. agreeing to that. I don't think we need to change the code because in the future they may want to go back to five minutes and rather than switching back and forth, I think we should just leave it as is and use the parameters that we've set up as a council. So just comment. Okay. Uh, it's a public hearing. So is there anybody from the public that would like to comment? But first, he has to say his name and address. That's right. Mark Gould, and I do not live in Greenwood Springs. And what's your address? He doesn't have to say it. Oh, he does. He does. He does. He does. You, you actually had three people that didn't do that, but 200 Oak Lane, Glenwood Springs, Colorado. So all I would tell you is, is that I think what the, the practice should be is three minutes are fine because a lot of people are um, annoying when they come up here, but when somebody has five minutes worth of information to depart to you, um, you should be willing to waive the three minutes when you hear enough information to want to hear a little more. Three's fine, but three doesn't always work. And so the fact that in the past it was five, if you could waive it when you hear something you want to hear more of, and it's three otherwise, I think that's a good practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the public? We'll now close public comment and bring it back to council for a motion. Council Hershey. I, I guess it was my fault at that last meeting, but it did say that. So I, Carl and, and Mr. Mayor, I'm less concerned about, you know, it's not that hard to find someone's address and I can stand up there and go, Tony, here's your 11th. I'm very careful about my address because of my job, but I understand that. But the other thing I sort of like, and this goes back, I think, to the Federalist Papers, is like when John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and Madison were writing those, they wrote them anonymously. And I think there's sometimes, you know, does it, you know, well, I guess it works both ways, but you say, well, I'm here to comment on what you're doing on Grand mm -hmm. Avenue. And by the way, my address is 1227 Grand Avenue, as opposed to I live in Wright Hole. I mean, so it would just be someone would come up here and say, my name is Mark Gould and I live in generally in Glenwood Springs. Would that be it? Or does not have to say anything? Yeah, no, it would be, um, hi, Carl Hanlon, not a resident of Glenwood. Okay. And so 
but I sort of, you know, I, I like. And nothing prevents somebody from providing more information. And if My someone wants to say, is, is Hi, I, I live on Grand Avenue and this issue is about Grand Avenue. Right. I live at 12th and Grand and you guys are building you know, you're knocking down it, that tree yeah. right there in front of my house. It doesn't prevent yeah. somebody from saying that, but in terms right. of what is required to speak to the body, it only would require that you say whether or not you're a resident of Glenwood Springs. And when was the city charted written? It was like 18. Yeah, um, <laughs> 1965. Right. So when you wrote it in 65, I think you and you and the other council members at the time, their intent was probably good. Like, well, maybe this person has an interest and we want to hear from people in Glenwood. Do we really need to hear from people who don't live here? They didn't elect us. And where, where are you from? And it's, it's interesting mm -hmm. to know, but I would support this change. I think it's a good idea. And if I would defer to council, if you want to include the three minutes or not, I, I do like what Mark says. Sometimes somebody's people are interesting, but maybe it goes both ways, Mr. Gould. You say, well, we're going to change it. It's one minute and you're done. No, I'm kidding. But three minutes seems appropriate for everybody. If you can't get it done, in three minutes, I think that's not mm -hmm. necessary. Thank you. Is there a motion? Uh, Charlie, you have your hand up, excuse me. Yes, I'd make a motion to approve ordinance 22-21, uh, uh, adopting exhibit A with the following amendments. That starting the second line, it should read, shall limit his her statements to no more than three minutes. The allocated period of three minutes may be increased by the presiding officer as provided below. If a period of excess of three minutes is requested, express permission must first be obtained from presiding officer. That's consistent with the practice, that's consistent with the procedural code we adopted last year. I'll second the motion. It's been moved by Charlie, seconded by Shelley. Further comments? Okay, Ryan, let's call the question. Councillor Hershey? Yes. Councillor Kelp? Yes. Councillor Wusso? No. Councillor Dem? Yes. Councillor Stepp? No. Mayor Pro Tem Wellman? Yes. Mayor Godis? Yes. It passed. It passes 5 2. All right. Thank you. All right. Next. Uh... Allies. Alice, thank you. <laughs> Item number 13, Not subsurface utility <laughs> engineering study split for a split. A split. Like oh, a seven very good. Thanks. Uh, for downtown alleys. A split. Yeah, I got it. It's a, oh, that's funny. It's the polling. You get a split. <laughs> I say we strike that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get our minds out of the gutter, guys. Oh, please save us from ourselves. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> um, good evening, Council City Engineer Kerry Park and um, Jillian Sutherland, DBA Director. Um, we are here to ask about the potential of a split of a um, subsurface um, utility engineering study for some of the downtown alleys. Um, the DDA in conjunction with city staff have been working on plans to redevelop the alleys. Um, you know, initially, you know, the first alley that was redeveloped was uh, immediately adjacent to, to smoke and um, just to the south of smoke. Um, in that alley reconstruction, um, we did address some drainage, but the, the real purpose of that alley reconstruction was um, to improve it for pedestrians, to make it um, more of a, a space where pedestrians would want to be. Um, that project was successfully completed and I think the alley is, is successful overall. Um, the city and the DDA would like to extend those kinds of treatments um, to the east. So alley, um, the alley in block 43, two alleys in block 44 and two alleys in block 45. I know you're gonna ask where they are. I know I should get educated probably, but what, what what could you yeah where are those is that blocks? Cooper sure. um I had an exhibit and I'm sorry I don't have it right up but um the the part of block 43 is the alley that connects into the current um the current smoke alley so they're right off the parking lot at the at 7th in um, Colorado so the alley that goes north south there 
Does that make sense? The corner of Mountain Family, um, the textiles, the weavers, right, so right, right there from there, heading north to before you hit south. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, so also block 44, which is the next alley to the uh, alley system to the east. So if you're standing on the Wing Street and you are um, at Mama Pierogi's and you are looking to the east towards the Hotel Colorado, that would be one of the alleys. Sorry. Towards the Western Hotel. Um, apologies. Um, <laughs> and uh, in addition, the North Sally, so South Alley off of that, that same block. And then finally, block 45, the next alley system over to the east. So immediately adjacent to the Hotel Denver. Um, and the North Sally and South Alley associated with that, that block as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so those are the block, the, the alleys that we've been working on. Um, Boundaries Unlimited have, has done civil plans for all of those alleys. Um, there are drainage improvements um, associated with it, the various different alleys. Um, the conversation that we've had is that, um, you know, in the past, the DDA has been more concerned about um, bringing in um, people to the downtown area. So they're concerned about pedestrian treatments and aesthetic treatments. And the city has focused on some of the, the infrastructure. And in this case, you know, the, the subsurface utility engineering is required for the construction of drainage facilities. So the DDA um, requested, I will let you take over from here so you can share this. Sure. So the city assisted with putting out an RFP or request for proposals um, from different engineering firms. And the DDA board voted in not our last meeting, but our July meeting um, to hire a firm in the amount of 124,000. And that was sort of right in the middle um, based on the expertise of the firm and just the, the cost effectiveness of it. Um, so the board has approved to fund this, but requested that we come to city council and talk about a uh, cost share with you all. As Terry mentioned, it is subsurface, so it is underground work. The DDA doesn't typically focus on, um, but we would be willing to do 50% of the cost. This would enable us to be able to get our engineering up to 100%. We'll understand the full cost of the project, and then we can pursue implementation funding. No questions? Just to clarify, when I look at the drawings in, that are in our packet, um, there's a T, and so is which one is 44 and which one is 45? What's the T? What's the cost? T one. Forty-four is the Mamakuroti's alley system. So that forms a T. But the, it it's the same visual. There's the same imagery in in forty-four and forty-five within the packet. Yep. Okay. And forty-five is it's behind um, the Hotel Denver. Okay. And then going north south, so essentially behind Masala and Curry. Got it. So that's why you see those as T's. Okay, and I think there's two, I think they're just duplicated maybe, or I'm just looking at them wrong, but thank you for clarifying. Okay. Any other questions? There's two T's, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There are two T's, and the reason that 43 isn't a T is because, as we say, it's already been improved, Charlie, the east-west portion. Mm -hmm. so. okay, thank you. Charlie, it's a question. Charlie, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. Um, Terry, this project is, is going to help our understand our utility system better, and so I remember in presentation and budget that uh, Matt talked about, we're going to be doing some of this with all of our infrastructure at some point. Isn't that correct? Um, it will help us understand our utility system better. Um, it is a state um, requirement now. A, a new state you talk in the microphone, system. please. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, Charlie, it will help us to understand our utility system better. Um, it is now a, a new state law that um, whenever there's a significant construction project and um, a contract with a government agency that um, these types of utility studies are, are required. Did that answer? Go ahead, Marco. Uh, just real quick, uh, probably to you, uh, if we do agree to this, where would the money come from? It would probably come from the general fund, either in the streets department or engineering. Okay, thank available? you. Yeah, we can afford that. Ingrid, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. May, if I may. Please. Um, I'd like to move uh, in the surface utility engineering study split, the downtown alleys that we approve a 50% share 
of the cost of up to, I guess, half of $124,000. Moved I'll by second. Marco, seconded by Shelley. All those in favor say aye. Oh, did you need to say aye. 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 Wait. Wait. Well, if it's unanimous, we don't need to say declare. So it's not going to be. Oh. <laughs> okay. Brian, can you call the question? Yeah. You want the motion, right? Uh, it's on the page. Yeah. Because I don't remember. It was the motion. It's on the group. The split. The split. So the motion is to approve the split. Up to 20, 124,000. Up to 124,000. 50% up to 100 grand. That's good. Everybody got that? I did first time. Mayor Godis? Yes. Councillor Dem? Yes. Councillor Hershey? No. Councillor Kaup? Yes. Councillor Wusso? Yes. Councillor Stepp? Yes. And Councillor Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Wellman? Yes. All right, it passes 6-1. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Oh, and great job getting the, uh, just while you're here, sorry, totally non sequitur, the farmer's market back up and going. Thank you, DDA and city staff for a joint project. Well done. Thanks. Uh, number 14, adoption of small and large transportation plan, transportation commission priorities. Small and large. Yes. <laughs> not medium size. No medium. I'm not sure there's even small uh, projects really anymore. But for the sake of argument, um, every year the uh, the City Transportation Commission reviews our capital project list in advance of our budget process, and they um, they mostly focus on um, making sure that the um, or recommending their priorities to the City Council, um, you know, for that process. And um, this year, um, the projects remain um, pretty consistent to what they have been in the past. Um, for the large projects, their number one project, again, is Southbridge. Um, their second project is the um, underpasses, the pedestrian underpass system at 27th. The third project is the 6 and 24 um, shared use path um, between Linden and Donegan. The number four project is the 6th Street reconstruction. And the number five project in the large category um, is the 8th Street reconstruction. And just for clarification, large projects are above a million dollars. For the small projects, um, their recommendations were the number one project to be 8th and Midland safety improvements, um, which, consider, um, which consist of widening the east side sidewalk along Midland Avenue, Overland Drive to 8th Street to a full width path to evaluate the reconfiguration of the merge lane um, to improve pedestrian safety and access. Their second project is rapid flashing beacons at, at numerous locations, four locations across the city. Um, the third project is 12th Street, the Riverside reconstruction, repaving to remove metal bars east of the river trail. This project was actually completed or is almost completed today. Um, the, the fourth project is the 10th um, Street school access safety improvements on the street bicycle facilities, bulb outs, warning lights, um, reduced car parking near corners. Um, in addition, they, um, they focused quite a bit on um, updating our cost estimates um, for all of our projects, for large and small projects. Um, they'd like to name all the ranked projects, large and small, in the city budget document so that they understand where they are. And they'd like to continue programmatic evaluation and work on transportation programs and services, including the transportation demand management, parking management, rebranding of the Wright Glenwood Springs, the bike share network and the seasonal tur uh, tourist circulator. Does the council have any questions? I, so does he, I go first? All right. Um, Terry, um, this great list. Um, this was something I was actually gonna bring up in council comments. I got a comment from somebody last weekend during the river fest and he was talking about the problems people are having at the roundabout coming off the bridge and then trying to get on the highway well people trying to cross over there are almost getting run over because when people try to get into the roundabout um traffic is not paying attention to them they're paying attention to how to get in the circle and get to all the various directions 
it can take you to. And he mentioned that he saw one woman almost get hit twice on two different cross rocks. Yes. My question is, is can we have the transportation commission look at this and can we get flashing lights put in those locations? So when pedestrians are crossing, people have a little bit more awareness that it's not just cars in that roundabout. So for the, the um, roundabout at the intersection of, um, of highway or uh, the 116 there, you know, that was designed with the Grand Avenue bridge, um, CDOT um, spent a lot of time on the design of that facility and it is, it remains a CDOT facility. We can um, share accident data with them and we can make recommendations and we can ask about um, adding flashing beacons at some of those crossing points. I, I would say that um, CDOT is reluctant to install flashing beacons on their highway system because um, they impede the flow in, in the circle and through the intersection and um, set up conditions where there could be rear end ac accidents. Um, but I don't mind having that conversation. And I think we have a vehicle to have that conversation coming up soon. Um, I think I've spoken to, to you guys about um, the safety data that we've um, developed with FHWA. Um, we'll have another presentation at the, um, I think it's the September 1st meeting about that safety data. Um, you'll be able to see the number of accidents within the, um, that interchange system. Um, CDOT is gonna be involved in our safety project. And so I think it will serve as a, a place where we can have those conversations and, and maybe make some recommendations. Again, you know, I, I would be reluctant to take that, in, you know, control um, of that intersection. It is one that I think um, it would be difficult to solve, but I, you know, not to say that we shouldn't ask. And, and on that note, if it couldn't be done within that circle itself, looking at crosswalks further back on some of those roads so that people could cross at that point. I know you is, can't do it everywhere, but that might help. Yeah, I agree. And that is something that um, I think we'll include with that safety project is medians, um, you know, both in um, Highway 82, but also in Highway 6, you know, between that section all the way from the interchange to um, Devereaux. So places where pedestrians can cross, you know, potentially adding new flashing beacons. Great. Thank you for taking a look at that. Sure. Oh, you heard him. Can I show you, is, when you say 12 months, you mean that's not your house. That's not your house. That's not your house. No. Those, you that's know, those are. That's park. Yeah. Um, oh, you're talking about the maintenance of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I, I, because it's sidewalks then. For, for Charlie's sake. Yeah. Oh. That's something that. That's I, that's not a street. Is it? That's a Tony, I'm not sure who would take responsibility okay. for that. It's either parks or it's streets. And I can, um, if you'll send that photo to me, I I'm, you thank you. I'll okay. um, send it up to Matt and Brian and we can argue over who whose responsibility okay. might be. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Marco. Uh, just real quick, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I think the list looks great. Um, I'm not familiar with the median on 8th Street. Is that where the meeting goes? Or did I make, did I miss up, miss up the street? Um, large projects or small projects? Oh, center no, median. Set, center median. On, oh, yeah. Uh, and, um, and I just need to look at the drawings. I'm actually looking forward to seeing what that looks like, but I assume it's necessary. So my point was the list looks great and I'm looking forward to the center median, if it, whatever it is, so. It'll be awesome when it's there. When it's there. Okay. Yeah, we, it was something that um, was a part of the Grand Avenue Bridge environmental assessment. The city okay. took responsibility for improvements in 8th Street as a part of that project. And so there is a plan. Um, it's a very beautiful plan. Yes. Um, and I will bring it to you at some point in time. Excellent, perfect. Terry, I guess my question is, this is um, a project list that's developed by the Transportation Commission. What are your thoughts on it professionally? Um, and do they disagree with the recommendations from the Transportation Commission? They don't, at least in the in the large projects. Um, every one of those um, large projects are um, right now um, something that I've passed to Steve to try to fund through the ANI. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think will be part of our discussions as we go forward with ANI and capital. Um, the small projects, 
the eighth and midland safety improvements i think are something that i i i disagree with somewhat you know the idea of that uh, that slip lane at the intersection of eighth and midland um, I have talked to the commission about uh, my ideas to try to help that situation, but I'm not willing to take out the, the slip lane there. Um, and so that would be something that we'd have to work on together. Um, rapid flashing beacons, I think are mostly a great idea everywhere. Um, I, I, you know, initially when we started putting, setting those across the city, I wanted to reserve them for especially dangerous intersections. So people didn't become used to them, but you know, they've been pretty effective and I, I like the locations that we've got so far. So I guess cautiously, I support all of those ideas. May I follow up with a question quick? So sure. uh, that slip lane, even if we were to be inclined to adopt this, is that going to pose a problem if that's still under small projects listed? You know, I don't you think so. I think we need to sign it there and we just need, okay. need some ideas. I know, um, you know, they've got some um, geometric ideas that they'd like to share with me and the Transportation Commission. And and I've got some ideas about how we can make that slip lane a little safer. So it's discussion and conversation. Yeah. Okay. With, with, is there any more questions? Yeah. Sorry. Um, two things. One, on our large projects, can you do a quick... Um, funding overview on each one. Of, I mean, I'm looking for super fast. Okay. So Southbridge, um, we are waiting for the um, potential award of that $33.1 million rural surface transportation grant. Um, we expect it ahead of the election. So sometime hopefully in October. Okay. Uh, we are submitting a grant for um, $750,000 for a DOLA application, which you just approved in the consent agenda. Um, that um, the funding, um, the match funding for that would be the rural surface transportation grant. Um, it did seem like Dola was positive about potentially getting that seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We did receive another million dollar earmark from Senator Hickenlooper's office um, to continue the project into um, twenty twenty three. We do need to fund um, the design of the project um, through the ANI fund, mm -hmm. and right now I don't have a firm estimate on what that is, but I'm estimating in you know in the range of a million dollars, hopefully less. Okay. Um, those are, that's, how, that's Southbridge. I'm trying to, gonna try and go quickly. 27th Street, um, we did receive the raise grant, yeah. um, $6 million through the raise grant. So um, RAFT is intending to rebid that project as soon as possible. Um, and hopefully we won't need any additional funding on that um, through the rebid bid process. Highway 6 and 24, the shared use path, we did make a presentation to the NTPR for $750,000 in MMOF funding for that project. Um, there are some calculations and balancing that they wanna do with all the projects that they received in, in that commission, um, but it, I, I believe that we will probably get the, the full $750,000. And engineering is completely done on that one? We um, need, additional funding and engineering to do the retaining walls. We don't have the structural capability in our office, okay. but um, I think that that's a minor number and will be included in our professional services. Great. Okay, perfect. Ingrid, do you mind if we, we're gonna, I think, have this as our budget presentation? I yeah. We've got two more. They're really fast. I just wanna know where she's at. Okay, we're really close. Um, Sixth Street, as you guys know, um, 100, uh, 1.75 million in the budget for this year will be rolled likely over into the budget for mm -hmm. 2023. Um, we did receive a $1.1 million grant from the Main Streets program. Okay. Eighth Street configuration, um, reconfiguration needs, we're at a 90% level right now. There are two, we need um, additional work, utility work and we need to consider um, a potential intersection, another potential intersection. So I'd like to budget in the a &I fund um, probably $300,000 for the completion of that design. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> you did awesome. <laughs> You're Excellent, and with that, um, I would like to move that we adopt the small and large transportation plan and the transportation commission priorities. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, please. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, with your permission, I'm gonna leave the meeting. Um, I think I've, I've got the limit of what I can do today. So I'm going to uh, leave. Yeah. The, uh, thank you. See you guys all. Thank you for letting me participate remotely. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for soldiering on. I moved to make Charlie stay through public, through council comments. <laughs>
I move to have Tony leave too. Okay. <laughs> Any council comments? I'll second that. <laughs> Seeing none, report from city administrator. Oh. <laughs> don't, don't go so fast. Eight o'clock. I, I understand. I have a quick uh, public comment now question. <laughs> Um, we had, we recently had the Parks and Rec Commission made a recommendation on the Sofa's View property, and I think that was sent out to all of council today. My understanding is that from here it goes to the FAB board, and so, and I believe that happens next week. So I was going to request that if that can be an agenda item to revisit that and look at how to move that project forward with all of our partners that are interested in it at our next meeting, the first meeting in September. I, I'm fine with that. Can you give me the second meeting of September? Because I think the first meeting we have, it's a really full meeting. It's it's a time sensitive Is and it? we've been okay. talking about it since last October. So if we could, it shouldn't take long, I wouldn't think. We have so. full Do we have a full council on the first one? Yeah. I have nowhere to go. Yeah, I'm around. Even though you want me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we can squeeze it in the first one. I don't know how full the first one is. So. I, I will commit personally for, for, for my role, I will commit to the first. I will try, but uh, okay. if I can't, because we do have the lodging tax adoption on the next meeting, and I don't know what else is going on. So I will commit to one of the two, but if someone else wants to second you to put it on for the first one, then I'm fine with it. Oh, I don't have to be fine with it. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, any other comments? City manager, city I have one more. I have a comment. Okay. Um, it's quick. I hope so. I would like to stress um, the 10th Street School Access Safety Improvements on Street Bicycle Facilities. It's in our small projects for transportation, but it has been brought up multiple times. I know that our acting city manager mentioned that we have looked into it to, you know, that it is a safer area, but we're getting feedback from the community. Um, and I, what I know is that if one child in our community was hurt because we didn't take it incredibly seriously, I would not, knowing that it's come up with the community, it's on our, our transportation list, priority list. I want to see us give some energy to that and see if there's something, even if it's in a, you know beyond even necessary, I wanna look into it because I wanna make sure that we put the safety of our children be above so many other things, even in this community. So future agenda item that we actually like sit down or direct staff, something along those lines. Anybody else? City management? Um, you guys may know that uh, we recently had uh, the death of Mary Noon, who did a lot of great work for our arts program and stuff. Um, there's going to be a memorial for her, and Brian Smith wanted me to just kind of get a head nod if it's okay if we waive the fees for that in Two Rivers Park. Good. Okay. That's it for me. Thanks. Carl? Yeah, oh, you suck. Um, uh, no, this is actually the center of my report. Um, as you know, we, sorry, I might. You guys had set uh, September 1 as the date to take final action on the um, ballot question. I just wanted to get a couple of drafts to you to start pondering. I'd also, we'd had a request from council regarding information on sunset provisions. So the questions in front of you, one includes a sunset, one does not. I would note that the other thing that is different this year from years past is that we now have a 250 word limit in the question that's being imposed across um, almost every um, county clerk is imposing that limitation on the ballot. Um, kind of in response to some, they keep getting longer and it, it causes some issues. Anyway, uh, I would also like to stress that I think um, I, I think the housing group um, met today, talked about it, wanted to stress that they believe that a sunset is appropriate. Just wanted to pass all that along to you guys. No action necessary. I just wanted to get something out there for you guys to start thinking about. 
keeping in mind that both of these are right near that 250 word limit. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd like the language to say something a little bit different, a word has to leave for one to come in, it's totally okay. But I just, you know, editing kind of 101. Uh, with that, I'd say to one thing. Because Tabor, Tabor limits the word. Yeah. All right. I'll do for a motion to adjourn, seeing as we have no correspondence. Absolutely. There's a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries.